section, which is entitled FIDIC 1999 or FIDIC 2017. Which is the future and what factors will decide? The FIDIC forms, so-called Rainbow Suite, are widely acknowledged, certainly in the UK, to be the leading standard form construction suite used for major international projects. The success of the 1999 suite was such that FIDIC waited nearly 20 years before publishing uh, its next edition, albeit there were uh, minor publications uh, here, in that time. There was an enormous amount of publicity at the time of the 2017 release, and an enormous amount has been uh, written about it. There were a very significant number of changes uh, and a very significant number of additions made to most of the key books, with the result that they are much longer, much more detailed, and arguably more administratively heavy uh, than uh, its predecessors. So four years on from the 2017, uh, publication. Um, are the parties sticking uh, with the 1999 edition or moving to the 2017 suite? What are the features that really matter to those advising and deciding on contract choice? There really can be no better person to chair a session on this than Ellis Baker. Ellis Baker is global head of White and Case's market leading construction and engineering practice. He is the leading authority on construction law and lead author of FIDIC Contracts Law and Practice, the principal construction text covering the whole suite of major FIDIC forms of contract. Ellis is independently recognised for both his project and disputes work and, and is one of the few individuals ranked band one for both Construction International Arbitration and Construction Contentious London categories by Chambers and Partners UK. He is the only lawyer named as the leading individual in both construction contentious and construction non-contentious categories by Legal 500 UK. He's advised developers, contractors, consultants and lenders on projects in more than 30 countries across five continents, including power stations, oil and gas installations, mining and metal facilities, and so on. Ellis was originally a barrister, uh, and as such, he acts as lead advocate for the disputes on which he is instructed. I think we can all agree that Ellis has given Professor Nazini a good run for his money on his resume. Ellis, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, James. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as James has rightly indicated in this session, it is devoted to the FIDIC contracts, and we will be considering the important question where the parties involved in international construction projects will adopt the 2017 books or whether they will continue to use the 1999 forms, which, as we all know, have been used successfully on many projects around the globe for many years now. At the outset, it gives me very great pleasure to introduce my panellists today. First of all, on my immediate right is Mark Crasso. Mark is a partner in the Construction and Engineering Disputes Department at Quinn Emanuel. His practice focuses on disputes arising out of large infrastructure, energy, petrochemicals and mining disputes around the world, especially in the Gulf and South America. And on my far right, it gives me very great pleasure to introduce Emma Schaftsmer. Emma is a partner in the International Construction and Engineering Department at CMS. She has over 20 years experience supporting clients resolving disputes on large scale and complex construction projects around the globe. She has spent 13 years of her career in Tokyo, supporting Japanese contractors and investors on their overseas projects. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this session is a panel discussion and is divided into two Parts. In the first half, I will invite each panellist to introduce an aspect of the subject. And in the second half, uh, there will be a panel discussion in which you, ladies and gentlemen, will be able to ask questions. At the end of the session, I will invite each panellist in turn to express their verdict on the question whether the future lies with the 1999 forms or the 2017 forms. Now, as we all know, the FIDIC suite, Rainbow Suite, comprises three principal forms of 
contract. The red book for employer design projects, the yellow book for plant and design build, and the silver book for EPC turnkey projects. It is with these three forms of contract with which we are concerned today. Now, of course, it's well known that the market's initial reaction to the 2017 books was, as James alluded to in his opening, putting it mildly, that it was taken aback by the obvious increase in size and complexity of these new books when compared with the 1999 forms. But having said that, the starting point when considering any form of construction contract is not the number of words on the printed page, but it is the contractual allocation of risk. Now, whilst the risk allocation in the 2017 books is broadly similar to those in the 1999 books, significant changes have been made in areas of particular sensitivity. A good example in this regard is the scope of the contractor's obligation in the yellow and silver books that the works, when complete, shall be fit for their intended purposes. In the 1999 books, the obligation was limited to purposes as defined in the contract. If no purpose was defined, the obligation did not apply. By contrast, in the 2017 books, if no purposes are defined in the contract, the equivalent provision now states that the works are to be fit for their ordinary purposes. Now, if one imagines, for example, a power station or a process plant being delivered under the yellow or the silver book, the inclusion of an obligation that the works be fit for their ordinary purposes potentially adds a very significant obligation of undefined scope when compared with the express performance criteria in the employer's requirements. So I consider that to be a very significant amendment indeed. Also of importance in the 2017 yellow and silver books is a new obligation upon the contractor to pay performance liquidated damages or shortfall in performance. There was no equivalent provision in the 1999 books. And I think that this is a welcome change that brings the FIDIC forms of contract into line with a well-established practice in bespoke contracting. The limitation of the contractor's liability is, of course, a sensitive matter for any construction contract. And an important amendment has been made in this regard. Under the 1999 books, the limitation of liability did not apply, and so the contractor's liability was unlimited in cases of fraud, deliberate default, or reckless misconduct. These grants have been retained in the 2017 books, but in addition, gross negligence has been added as a further ground on which the contractor's cap on liability does not apply. The addition of gross negligence is, I would suggest, a significant broadening of the grounds where the contractor's liability is unlimited and will no doubt be of great concern to many contractors. As a fourth example, the contractor's entitlement to an extension of time in circumstances where there is concurrent delay and so we have two causes of delay, one for which the employer is responsible, one for which the contractor is responsible, is of course a subject of much discussion. The 1999 books did not seek to deal with this matter. By contrast, the 2017 books do include an express provision on the subject, although I must say that that provision is disappointing. The new provision provides that where there is concurrent delay, the contractor's entitlement to an extension of time is to be assessed in accordance with what is now called the special provisions to be agreed by the parties. And if no such special provisions have been agreed on this subject, then the text of the clause says that 
the position to be determined is, quote, as appropriate, taking due account of the relevant circumstances. To me, that gives no real guidance indeed. And so it's fair to say that FIDIC notably failed to take a position on this important matter. Now, whilst risk allocation is fundamental to any contract, um, any contract will inevitably also need an effective means uh, to put that risk allocation into effect. And for that reason, I should like Ma to address the contract administration and claims procedure in the bid contracts. Ma. Thanks, Alison, and thanks for the um, introduction earlier um, in your introductory comments you noted the increase that there has been in the 2017 FIDIC forms and, and perhaps as many here will be aware it's the provisions dealing with contract administration and claims which are the most heavily amended provisions in the new FIDIC forms. According to the notes which appear in the introduction to the new forms there were two main reasons for this. First, to set out in more detail what was required in each um, step um, of the claims administration process, also contract administration. Uh, and secondly, to treat contractor claims and employer claims equally. Just going to say something briefly about the second of, of those reasons, first of all, um, and what follows is with respect to, to the drafters of, of the new forms, I'm not sure that equality um, of formal treatment of contractor claims and employer claims was um, perhaps the most necessary of changes. I think we're all aware that on a construction project, contractors face very different issues from employers. Their claims concern different matters, arise at different junctures and so on. And contractors, putting things neutrally are, are the parties which are more affected by change during a project, hence more likely to be the, the party making claims. So perhaps unnecessary to um, treat the two sets of claims in the same way. And, and I'd suggest that that change is, is perhaps not a reason for choosing 2017 over 1999, but the same applies vice versa. Uh, but uh, de dealing with um, some of the changes in the uh, procedures, um, certainly there is much more structure to both contract administration and claims administration. I'm going to focus on, on the latter, but just to give one example of, of the uh, former, uh, in terms of contract administration, um, there's now many more obligations on the engineer. For example, if the engineer issues an instruction, and the contractor responds saying, I think that's a variation that the engineer has to respond within seven days confirming the instruction. Um, otherwise, it's deemed that the instruction is revoked. So that's just an example of the um, increased um, obligations that there are on the engineer in, in contract administration. In terms of claims administration, again, uh, more structure and more formalities to the process. I'm not going to go through the process ad nauseum. I don't think this is the right forum for that. And certainly plenty of helpful resources online that will give you step by step um, diagrams showing the um, new claims process. But um, as I said, more formalities to give one example at the very start of the claims process and I'm also going to be referring most of the time to claims by contractors again, just for the reason that that's what tends to arise most in practice, but what I will be saying will apply equally to, to employer claims. But at the start of the process, a contractor makes a claim or rather gives notice of a claim. Um, that is now giving notice with a capital N of a claim with a capital C. Um, the contractor's notice has to take the prescribed form um, set out in FIDIC 2017 and has to be identified um, as a notice, which stands in contrast to 1999, where it was just give notice of a claim all in lowercase letters, which gave rise to the issue that I'm sure many of us have, have faced where you have an argument later on as to whether an informal notification of something 
um, perhaps by an email or in a meeting, um, whether that constitutes notice of a claim. So th there is now um, clarity on, on what the contractor is uh, required to provide and perhaps helpfully there's also provisions stating that progress reports and program updates do not constitute notice of a claim. More steps in the process as well as I mentioned, I'm just going to mention one example again. After um, the contractor's initial notice of claim, um, the engineer um, has the obligation um, to identify um, if the um, notice is out of time. If the engineer doesn't give such a notice, then it's deemed that the notice of claim is valid. When one looks at the detail of those provisions, uh, there are um, perhaps some um, wording issues which, which might give rise to interesting um, discussions um, in the future. Um, because going back to the notification provision, there is a strict um, time bar there stating that if the notice is not given within time, contractor has no entitlement, employer has no liability. Why does the engineer need to give a notice if, if the claim is out of time and, and has those effects? And then if the engineer fails to give the notice and, and the claim is deemed to be valid using the words of FIDIC, does that mean that an out of time claim is, is now um, live? Once again, I think there are arguments open um, either way there. Um, more detail um, in uh, what is required in each step of the process. Um, taking the contractor's detailed statement, the second submission that they have to make um, after their initial notice of claim. The content um, uh, has increased, the content requirements have increased, albeit that there's now more time for the contractor to prepare their submission. Um, among other things, the contractor now has an obligation to provide all contemporary records on which it relies with the detailed submission. Um, although perhaps um, from the employer's perspective, that um, doesn't go quite as far as it could because contemporary um, is defined as things immediately at the same time as or immediately after um, the claim event. There's no um, obligation to provide contemporary records demonstrating um, the effect that the claim event has had. I've referred already to one increased obligation on the engineer in terms of contract administration. The engineer also has more obligations in the claims administration process, uh, including um, an obligation to assist um, the parties to uh, resolve uh, claims, which, which Emma might say a little bit more um, about. Um, in, in doing so, the and also in determining claims if they can't be uh, resolved by agreement, um, the engineer has an obligation to act neutrally. What I'm about to say might sound a bit stupid coming from the mouth of a disputes lawyer, but I'm actually not quite sure what neutrally means. The, the reason why I say that is that FIDIC have stated that they deliberately did not use the word impartially. Now, I would have said that neutrally and impartially are synonymous, um, but it would appear that they are not. And the engineer's duty is not to act impartially, but, but neutrally. Again, not quite sure what that means, and, and it perhaps puts the um, engineer um, in a, a little bit of a, a difficult position. Also bearing in mind that they have to act fairly um, at the same time. And, and one that, that's, that obligation was already there, but, but one might uh, raise a question as to what FAIR means in, in the context of determining claims according to um, the contract. Anyway, they're just an, an overview of um, some of the changes in contract administration and, and claims um, administration, um, obviously designed to um, uh, encourage the early uh, resolution of claims, but I, I think that time will tell whether um, that will be achieved. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, now, we all know that disputes arise from time to time on many construction projects. And accordingly, I should now like Emma to discuss the dispute avoidance and resolution provisions. Thank you, Ellis, and thank you for your kind introduction as well. Um, so I think, I think it's fair to say that the dispute um, avoidance and dispute resolution provisions in the FIDIC 
2017 forms really have come to the fore much more so than they were in the 1999 forms. And I think that we can see this mainly, uh, mainly in, in three broad uh, categories. So the first is that there's a much broader and I think stronger platform um, for the early identification and um, uh, uh, tackling of issues as they arise on the project. And that is, of course, the first step in any type of uh, dispute avoidance. So to give you a um, few examples as to how this can be seen, um, the first is, is that now any party can call a management meeting um, uh, and, and can ask um, any number of third parties if they would be able to attend. So this would include, therefore, uh, uh, interfacing contractors that aren't a party to this particular contract utilities for example i've seen many disputes about utilities that need to be moved and um, interfacing that into into construction works um, and so forth so uh, that i think is a very useful provision to try and um, actually start uh, uh, having all of the stakeholders be uh, discussing issues as and when they arise and coupled with that we now have the advanced warning system that actually comes originally from the Gold Book when that was uh, published in 2008. And we also see it under other forms of contract. It's very well known in the English um, NEC form of contract, for example. Um, and the point of the advanced warning system is there's a, there's a provision in the contract that expressly requires parties to highlight um, and give notice as and when potential issues might be arising. And this is not only in terms of time and cost, but also to generally, if anything, um, is anticipated to affect the performance of the contractor's work um, or otherwise the actual uh, performance of the work once it's been constructed. Um, and the engineer then also has the ability to write to the parties or, or to ask the parties to put forward their suggestions for trying to um, either avoid uh, 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 the issue or the impact that's being anticipated um, or otherwise propose mitigating effects. Um, and while that provision, it, it doesn't go so far as mandating any um, uh, sanctions if the parties do not comply with that. I think it's interesting when you read the claims provisions that the engineer is, um, or employer's representative, is obliged to take into account all relevant circumstances. And I would suggest that the, the, the uh, uh, utilization of the advance warning provisions would be something that he, should, he or she should be taking into account. Um, and then thirdly, just in terms of early identification and, and dealing with issues, as Mark uh, uh, touched upon, the engineer is required to consult with the parties before then going on to make a determination. Now, the requirement to consult was, of course, in the 1999 form, but really by reference. Now it's a standalone clause as of itself. Uh, the engineer is um, also supposed to produce a written record of the consultation, which I think should give contractors a bit more comfort that the consultation will be taken seriously and, uh, and that they will have had their um, uh, views heard, particularly when the engineer is, in a sense, um, making a determination on something that he himself really has done, which is always a tricky element of those um, uh, um, uh, engineer determination provisions. So the second um, item then is in relation to the uh, notice of no, sorry, the, the, the process of issuing notices of dissatisfaction to get you through to the next stage of the dispute resolution process. So I think that these notices of dissatisfaction can be seen as, let's say, a key to unlocking the door to get you to the next stage of uh, the dispute resolution procedure. So what we have new in the 2017 form is that if a party disagrees with an engineer's determination, then it has to issue a notice of dissatisfaction. Otherwise, the engineer's determination becomes final and binding and a failure to comply with the engineer's determination 
of itself can be referred to arbitration. So that is an important notice of satisfaction. It, it, it moves you forward um, into the next process, which would then be the uh, uh, dispute avoidance and adjudication board. Um, there's a short time limit, 42 days, um, after issuing your notice of dissatisfaction with the engineer's determination to then make the referral to the DAAB. So this is important, I think, in making sure that claims are uh, um, uh, identified early and taken through to the next step. Um, and then, of course, if there's a, uh, a dissatisfaction with the DB's decision, then there's a notice of dissatisfaction to then take you to um, arbitration that was there before. Um, and then finally, in terms of the uh, uh, dispute board, so what we have now is a dispute avoidance forward slash adjudication board. And this is now a standing board um, as opposed to having a choice as to whether it would be ad hoc or not. And I think that there is a lot of utilisation in having a standing board. And certainly when I have um, uh, uh, been working on, on projects uh, with clients that have a dispute, a standing dispute board, they've certainly found um, uh, that to be a great support in large projects. The important thing, and was actually one of my favourite bits of the new form, is the provision that expressly allows the dispute board to provide informal assistance to the parties. And not only saying parties um, may write to the dispute board and ask for informal assistance, but also the ability, uh, the authorization really for the dispute board to write to the parties or say to the parties, hey, look, we see an issue here. You might want to ask us to give some informal assistance here. And I like that proactive element that the dispute board has been given to try and support the parties um, through, through the project. Um, and then, um, of course, the uh, uh, dispute board's decisions, uh, whether they are temporarily uh, binding because there's been a notice of dissatisfaction or if they're final and binding because there hasn't been, those decisions will be enforceable uh, through arbitration and that's also uh, compliance with those decisions is um, now in the 2017 form reinforced by termination rights. Thank you, Emma uh, Ladies and gentlemen, those are the mini presentations by way of overview. Does anybody in the audience, either in person or online, have any questions for the panel? Ellis, maybe I can um, uh, start that off. The, the online delegates have been pretty active. Um, the first uh, the first comment is, is really a statement, uh, and then I'll follow with a question which is on the same subject. Uh, the comment is the reason for, for this approach, referring to the way concurrent delays are dealt with in respect of concurrent delays, is that there is no internationally recognised single method dealing with the same, and that's from Husni Maddy, Vice Chair of the Phoenix Contract Committee. I can see he's smiling. Um, the question is, is this uh, uh, from an unknown source? After decades of case law, do we still not have any seminal case that sets a firm precedence on concurrent delay? There are a number of schools of thought that appear to be present, winner takes all approach, which delay is more dominant, each party to bear the impact of its own delay, offsetting approach. How can this be efficiently resolved in the FIDIC contracts? Ellis. Why don't I start with that? Um, so, Husni Mali's comment about there being no internationally recognised um, position, um, that is, of course, the comment and the explanation which is made in the, the guidance notes to the um, FIDIC contracts. Um, they also do refer to um, the Society of Construction Law Protocol as an example of something that parties uh, may wish to consider. Uh, and so that, that is that the, the, the point about there being no general standard was the explanation for uh, why um, in the new form it was left to the parties to reach an agreement. Um, obviously, when you look at the question of um, is there any seminal case, um, I think one has to bear in mind that the FIDIC contracts are used around the globe 
uh, and certainly with often many different governing laws. And so I think it's very different, give, difficult given that context to say, oh, well, we must look at that case in respect of the, the, the fitting contracts. And that's why I made my remark that I think, given that the new forms are very prescriptive, I think it would have been helpful for FIDIC to have taken a position, as they have taken a position on so many other things. Um, but perhaps um, I could ask both of my panellists to comment. So perhaps, Mark, would you like sure. to give me your views? Yes, thanks, Ellis. Uh, as a disputes lawyer coming at things often um, after the event, I, I would suggest that true concurrency rarely arises in practice, but I can say that sort of with, with the benefit of you know, having a delay expert or, or whatever um, as, as part of the team, the delay expert has analysed all of the project records and after the event has, has been able to work out what was um, the true driving cause of delay on a project. However, if you're looking at things from the um, perspective of claims administration and trying to resolve disputes as a project is going on, I can see that actually it would be helpful to have a definition of the way that things should be resolved. Um, and, and I'd suggest that parties should take up the opportunity um, to try and agree that um, in um, uh, the contract um, so that the engineer or employer's representative, sorry, I was referring mostly to the engineer earlier, but obviously under the silver book, it's the um, employer's representative. I think for them to have a a tool um, that's easy um, to apply um, to try and um, deal with things as um, they arise. I think that that would be helpful for parties to do that. Emma, go ahead. yes, I think it's probably just a uh, just a note and observation. I think that in most of the bespoke contracts that I that I see and actually have seen over the past 15, 20 years, um, more often than not, there's a provision that simply says if there is any concurrent delay, then the contractor will not get any time or money. Um, I think that um, there might have been a reason why the FIDIC drafters felt that they need to put something into the contract. I do agree with you, Ellis. I think, I think it would have been um, more helpful to um, have, have specified or, or maybe not, or maybe just, a, just have added a very wide sweeping provision like we see in the bespoke contracts that simply says the contractor gets neither. Um, so. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions in person or online? We, we have plenty uh, online uh, questions. Um, I asked the next question uh, somewhat tentatively. Uh, in terms of FIDIC contract, contracts, what would the panel suggest is a leading comprehensive practitioner's text? The one with limited, <laughs> the one with limited experience uh, of FIDIC. Well, Ellis, I think I will not start. answer that one, so I'll start with Emma. <laughs> Emma can oh, answer. Um, I think probably the contract itself, to be honest <laughs> with you. Um, so uh, FIDIC, FIDIC, of course, does have guidance notes in the, in their contracts. There are many textbooks that you can that you can read as well. There's a lot online, um, but I think the start of any analysis of any contract has to be the contract itself. So, uh, I don't know if Alice bought this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, deliberately, but um, this, this is Alice's book written, obviously, with um, some of his colleagues, um, uh, past and, and former, uh, uh, sorry, current and uh, former, I, I think. Um, but it's certainly a very um, comprehensive um, guide, um, so I would uh, very much recommend um, Alice's book. Excellent. Well, the, uh, the fiver will be slipped into your <laughs> uh, after this session. Um, Another question from uh, uh, the online delegates. Do the panel support the application of FIDIC Golden Principles? Well, why, why don't I start with that? Uh, I, I would say when one looks at the Golden Principles that um, many of them are quite uncontroversial if one looks at what the Golden Principles are. And obviously, they were introduced by FIDIC. They're not part of the contract, but they are a strong recommendation to the parties. And when one goes through them, the five principles are, first, that the rights and obligation of the parties must be generally as implied by the general conditions and appropriate for the project. Uh, second, the particular conditions must be drafted clearly and unambiguously. Nobody would disagree with that. Uh, the third one is, um, 
the particular conditions must not change the balance of risk and reward in the general conditions. Now, of course, Philip has talked about that for many years, and that's why they, they put that in as a crucial uh, golden principle. I think one needs to bear in mind in that respect that the Philip contracts, like any form of contract, are only a starting point and they will have to be customised uh, for the needs of any project. Um, so I do, I do think one does need to bear in mind that you know, significant changes to risk allocation may need to be made to take into account the needs of the particular project. Obviously, if significant changes to the risk are going to be made, that needs to be dealt with carefully and consistent, consistently. And if you look at the, the design, the world of design build contracts, um, of course, FIDIC itself publishes two forms of design build contract, the yellow book and the silver book. And if you're in that world, you might want to think about, with both of those have very different risk allocations, and you might want to think about which would be the appropriate starting point. The, the fourth golden principle is all time periods must be reasonable. Nobody can object to that. The final golden principle is that all disputes must be referred in the first instance to a dispute adjudication board, which will pr produce a decision which is provisionally binding. So uh, FIDIC has clearly nailed its colours to the mast with that respect and elevated that to a golden principle for their contracts. My own personal view on that is whilst DABs are a very important part of the dispute resolution landscape, I don't my own, myself think one can say that they are so much of a prerequisite that they absolutely must be included in any contract. And indeed, in many FIDI contracts, um, the DAB is removed. So that, that's my view on the golden principles. Uh, Ellis, if I, if I could interrupt, the, the questions are coming in thick and fast uh, and we're, we're limited on <coughs> time. So. Um, if I could ask for one answer, one question. I think we've got 15 questions to get to. I'm not sure we'll get through all of those. Um, uh, the next question is, in respect of the comments regarding neutrality and impartiality, is this not something that requires addressing in the FIDIC guidance notes? Or is it to acknowledge the fact that the engineer or his, her representative is often employed by the employer? To me, this negates the overall role of the engineer, which was supposed to focus on the project execution rather than client employer requirements. Well, that's that one right. for you. OK, sure. Uh, I, I certainly agree with a lot of the sentiments um, un underlying the question. The engineer um, is in a, um, a role which under 2017, which um, perhaps has um, pulls in, in different um, directions obviously in, in appointed and employed and paid um, by the employer. Uh, primary responsibility probably for contract administration to make sure that the contract is moving forward um, as it should, um, but now also given a role in trying to encourage agreement between the parties when matters such as claims are referred to the engineer uh, for determination obligation to do that fairly again whatever that means in in the context of uh, determining claims in accordance with the contract um, and the law um, but also doing so neutrally which is not the same as in, impartially uh, I, I think it's it is a difficult um, position for um, engineers um, to take up um, also um, there's just the inherent risk uh, I would suggest of um, an appearance of uh, bias um, on one side or the other um, the contractor might think that the engineer being paid um, by the employer is inherently biased or perhaps the employer um, disagrees with the engineer's intervention in the claims process uh, which may undermine party trust in the engineer's role which could um, undermine trust in, in the project generally and undermine the way that things uh, move forward. So th that is probably not a definite answer to the question, but I think just underscores the um, difficulty I would suggest that engineers will have in fulfilling all of their different responsibilities. Excellent. Well, at the moment it's uh, online audience for uh, in-person audience nil, but I, I see we've got a, a, a question. Please state your name and your question. Also, uh, 
So the question is, uh, contract administration uh, is often a, a difficult area. Will the 2017 suite uh, lead to more problems and more disputes? Uh, Emma, perhaps this might be one for you. Thank you. So um, I think that it could well be. Um, we were we were having a discussion earlier um, of, at the you know wide range of experience that you have across consultant en engineers across different jurisdictions. And I think that, you know, we've heard from FIDIC that um, the World Bank and another a number of development banks have, have said that they're adopting the 2017 forms for their projects. I'm not sure exactly whether that's all projects or if it's the major projects. My, my concern would be is if you don't have a sufficiently experienced engineer who is then uh, um, uh, um, uh, 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 tasked with managing uh, the 2017 project and I think it's going to cause therefore projects for both employers and contractors as, uh, as Mark said there are a lot of deeming provisions in the contracts that allow for automatic um, um, uh, resolution of issues or lapsing of, 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 of notices, lapsings of, of, of instructions for example um, and and if if the contract isn't properly managed then then yes I think it, the there will be huge difficulties for parties. Um, I think the early projects that use the 2017 forms are going to be very instructive. Thank you. Um, we've only time for one more question. Uh, there are a number of questions that have come in online uh, and I can see more questions in the audience, um, so we've run out of time. Uh, to the online delegates, Please submit your questions. I'm sure they'd be happy to take them to Ellis, Mark or Emma. Um, you'll find their contact details uh, online. Uh, but let me just finish with uh, one final question and, and a short, sharp answer uh, if possible. Uh, this is from Julio Bueno in Brazil. Do you believe that both versions, 1999 and 2017, were fully equipped to handle uh, an exceptional event such as the COVID-19 pandemic and its consequences. Quite a difficult one to encapsulate. Well, 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 why, don't I, why don't I do that? Um, I think they were as good as any published form can be. Uh, no published form can be perfect to deal with such an event which was so wholly unanticipated by everybody. All right, well, please uh, join me uh, in thanking uh, Ellis, Mark and Emma. That was a, an enlightening and entertaining first session. Uh, thank you to you all. Great.